on our journey through 1 Samuel. We're on chapter 18. Um, I was talking to Mark and Chris and Charlie the other day, and I, I, we're going to take a, a break from a chapter by chapter look at something uh, a little different for me anyway. Uh, a few years ago, Answers in Genesis wrote an article called The Dangers of the Hebrew Roots Movement. Okay, and I wrote a rebuttal to that. It's on our website. Um, it's quite lengthy because I like to be thorough when I help straighten people out on Scripture. And uh, we, may, we may cover a good portion of that a, few, a little bit at a time. Because I, I'd like, I, I think uh, it's important. We're not necessarily Hebrew Roots people. We're just Scripture people and all of it. But uh, people would, could easily put us in that category. So, and if they think we're dangerous, we need to show them why we're not. Um, is it, you like that? Okay. Yeah, I don't know if it'll be next week or week after, but pretty soon. And I don't know if we'll, we'll probably uh, put Samuel on hold for a few weeks. <clears throat> okay, we're on chapter 18, verse 1 says... Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Jonathan and David formed a very strong friendship, and it's accordance with and uses the same wording as the Torah, by the way. Uh, we read in Leviticus 19, verse 18, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Jonathan and David, they shared a lot in common also. They were both warriors, and remember, Jonathan also battled against and killed many Philistines himself. Um, Elohim will use this relationship to accomplish his will. Verse 2, And Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. You know, his robe, armor, sword, bow, and belt probably signified Jonathan as the son of King Saul. Jonathan is relinquishing this right to inherit the kingship from his father and giving it to David, since that's what's going to happen anyway. Verse 5, so David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered, and Saul set him over the men of war. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Hmm. You know, David was obedient to, uh, to the commands of Saul. And he prospered in all that he did. David did. David was set over the army, and this was pleasing to the people. The passage flashes back to the time right after David killed Goliath. And he was greeted with this celebration. Saul didn't much like that celebration. <clears throat> he didn't just want the glory, he wanted all the glory. Verses 8 and 9, Then Saul became very angry, for this saying displeased him, and he said, They've ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they've ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Saul was envious of the song they sang for David, the attention he was getting, uh, as opposed to being jealous. Uh, he was envious, not jealous. Jealous is a different word. All right, that's, a, that's a, a name of our Heavenly Father is jealous. Uh, that doesn't mean you want something from somebody else. That does, that's not what jealous means. Jealous means you want to protect what's yours, okay? Your spouse or whatever. Elohim wants to protect his people. And he doesn't want them flirting with other gods. <clears throat> but here, Saul's envious 
because of that song, there is no reason in the world to suspect David would try to take his kingdom. But he lived in fear because he just knew that would... Why did he think that was the case? Why did he think David was going to try and take his kingdom? David showed no such desire, attempt. But why did Saul... He just knew he was going to do it. Why? No, no, he's envious. <laughs> no. <laughs> the reason Saul knew that David, just in his mind, he knew David was going to try and take his kingdom was because if he were in that position, that's what he would do. Okay? Because he's petty. He's small. He's, uh, he's, the big thing about him is his ego. That's why he knew David was going to do it, because if Saul were in that position, that's what he'd do. Verse 10, it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from Elohim came mightily upon Saul, and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand as usual, and a spear was in Saul's hand. The term raved there, in King James it's prophesied, and it should be prophesied actually, how could Saul be prophesying and be intent on such evil? Um, there's a couple explanations for this. One is that the conjugation of the Hebrew verb could mean he was pretending to prophesy. Could be that. But more than likely, the explanation is that the evil spirit sent to him by Elohim, that's just back a couple chapters in 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 and 15. Now the spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul... And an evil spirit from Yahweh terrorized him. Saul's, ser Saul's servants then said to him, Behold, now an evil spirit from Elohim is terrorizing you. This evil spirit was deceptive by giving Saul the ability to prophesy while conjuring the evil in his heart at the same time. That was that evil spirit that he had in him. Verses 11 and 12, And Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I'll pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David, for Yahweh was with him, but had departed from Saul. We're told David escaped his presence twice. It's likely the second time Saul did not catch David off guard. David, was, he had his head on a swivel when he's around Saul. Verse 13, therefore Saul removed him from his presence and anointed, appointed him as his commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David was prospering in all his ways, for Yahweh was with him. When Saul saw that he was prospering greatly, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, and he went out and came in before them. Saul knew that the people loved David, and apparently he did not want a rebellion. So now he's going to try and use the Philistines to kill David. Verse 17, then Saul said to David, here is my oldest daughter, Mirab. I'll give her to you as a wife, only be vigilant, be a valiant man for me and fight Yahweh's battles. For Saul thought, my hand shall not be against him, but the hand of the Philistines be against him. Um, Saul offers his uh, daughter to him as a wife if he fights the Philistines. And he's trying to, he appointed David to have a thousand men. So let's see what his plan is, is here. Eight, verses 18 and 19. But David said to Saul, Who am I and what is my life or my father's family in, in Israel that I should be king's son-in-law? So it came about at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Maholothite, for a wife. Saul is filled with envy and rebellion against Elohim. He demonstrates the fact his word is meaningless, okay? He promises his daughter to David and gives her to a, another guy. So he's, uh, his word isn't worth anything. Uh, that's not, a good, that's not a, good, uh, a good look for a king, okay? Verse 20, now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. When they told Saul, the thing was agreeable to him. And Saul thought, I'll give her to him that 
she may become a snare to him, that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David, For a second time you may be my son-in-law today. Then Saul commanded his servants, Speak to David secretly, saying, Behold, the king delights in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So he's trying to set a, a trap for David by using his other daughter. Verse 23, so Saul's servant spoke these words to David. But David said, is it trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law since I'm a poor man and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul reported to him according to these words which David spoke. Saul then said, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. <clears throat> Saul gets his servants to secretly persuade him to marry Michael. Uh, David says, hey, I'm, I'm a poor guy. I, I don't have a dowry for you. I can't give you anything. The servants tell him, Saul wants the death of 100 Philistines. It's a dowry. Then he wants you to cut off their foreskins. <laughs> I, yeah, you know. Uh, that says, King, <laughs> can I just take pictures? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you know what Saul thought? He thought David trying to kill that many Philistines, that's going to be his end. He'll be done. Okay, he, he can't do that. You, you got to keep in mind, though, didn't David say, you know, I killed a lion and a bear with my bare hands. Well, there's another guy that did that, too, in Scripture. Who was that? Samson. Uh, see, if I remember right, didn't he kill over a thousand Philistines in one outing? Uh, and David is displaying kind of the same attributes. Huh. Verses 26 and 27. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David to become the king's son-in-law before the days had expired. David rose up and went, he and his men, and struck down 200 men among the Philistines. Then David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full number to the king so that he might become the king's son-in-law. So Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, for a wife. Well, the plan failed. We're told Michael loved David, but she's still her father's daughter. She later rebels against David. I think it's Michael. She later uh, rebelled against David. 2 Samuel 6, starting at verse 20. We read, but when David returned to bless his household, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants' maids as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. Mm, excuse me. So David said to Michael, it was before Yahweh who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of Yahweh over Israel, therefore I will celebrate before Yahweh. And I'll be more lightly esteemed than this, and will be humble in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. So her animosity and bitterness did not uh, serve her will. Verse 28 of 1 Samuel 18, when... Saul saw and knew that Yahweh was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. Then Saul was even more afraid of David. Thus Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines went out to battle and it happened as often as they went out that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul. So his name was highly esteemed. You know, we can surmise from the text that David was the wisest of Saul's commanders when he went to battle against the Philistines, he was certainly successful. Saul was more afraid of David, but the people loved him, and he was highly esteemed by the people. 
This put Saul in a precarious situation since he wanted David dead. Chapter 19, first three verses. So now Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, is seeking to put you to death. Now, therefore, please be on guard in the morning and stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I'll speak with my father about you. If I find, it, if I, uh, if I find out anything, then I shall tell you. So Saul ordered all in his command, under his command, put David to death. David would not stand a chance except for the fact that Jonathan was his good friend and warned him to go hide. Verse 4, then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Do not let the king sin against his servant David, since he's not sinned against you and since his deeds have been very beneficial to you. For he took his life in his hand and struck the Philistine, and Yahweh brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by putting David to death without a cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul vowed, As Yahweh lives, he shall not be put to death. <clears throat> well, you know, we've already learned that his word doesn't mean much. Jonathan tried to reason with his father here concerning David. And he told him, you're trying to kill an innocent guy. The guy, it's only, all he's done is good things for you and for others. So Saul recants that order to, for him to be put to death. Verse 7, then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these words. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as formerly. When there was war again, David went out and fought with the Philistines and defeated them with great slaughter, so that they fled before him. Now there was an evil spirit from Yahweh on Saul as he was sitting in his house with a spear in his hand, and David was playing uh, the harp with his hand. So Elohim sends an evil spirit to Saul that made him an unstable individual. Um, we have the scene again. David's playing the harp for Saul, and Saul is sitting there with his spear in his hand. Now, that's already been hurled at him once. <clears throat> I'm sure David's on the notice here. Verse 10, and Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence so that he stuck the spear into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Then Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, if you don't save your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be put to death. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went out and fled and escaped. So Saul tries to kill David again. Then he ordered all under him to kill David again. Michael warns, warns David to flee. Get out of here. Verse 13, And Michael took the household idol and laid it on the bed and put a quilt of goat's hair at its head and covered it with clothes. When Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He's sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me on his bed that I may put him to death. When the messengers entered, behold, the household idol was on the bed with a quilt of goat's hair at its head. Now, it, likely what happened here is David, supposing to be sick, was in the chamber of Michael, his wife. Now, a woman's chamber was pretty much held sacred. The servants of Saul just saw the dummy in the bed, and left and told Saul, okay? On Saul's orders, they entered her chambers and found the dummy. Verse 17, so Saul said to Michael, Why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? Michael said to Saul, he said to me, Let me go, why should I put you to death? Huh. So Michael lied to Saul by saying David threatened her by killing her. She didn't help him. Verse 18, now David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. But 
when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the spirit of Elohim came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. So the messengers of Saul were overtaken by the breath of the Father, and they spoke the word of Elohim just as David and Samuel were doing. Verse 21, and when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. So Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. Then he himself went to Ramah and came as far as the large well that was in Siku, and he asked him and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Behold, they're at Naoth in Ramah. And he proceeded there to Naoth in Ramah, and the spirit of Elohim came upon him also, so that he went along prophesying continually until he came to Naoth at Ramah. He also stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel, and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Hmm. Well, this passage shows the people, and it shows Saul himself, that David was chosen by Elohim. They don't have to go just by Samuel's words or David's words on this. They had visual evidence with their inability to apprehend David because they're being over, overtaken by the word of the Father. Saul being stripped of his clothing is likely his royal attire, by the way. This indicated that he had to submit to the position of David as his son Jonathan had done earlier. Any questions on that? Any thoughts? Let's hear it, David. Yeah. It, um, in the Greek it does, but not so much in the Hebrew. Um, but it's the same term used in love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. And that's what Jonathan did. He loved David as himself. So... Nothing nefarious going on between the two gentlemen. Um, I think Saul just kind of soaks up all the evil in these stories. So. Well, is that the end of the story there? <coughs> nope. I was going to say. It's the end of chapter 19, though. Some point I put their clothes back on. <laughs> One would think. Um, they had no Second Amendment back then. Boy, I miss Tom. Didn't you all miss Tom? No, that's fine. We had a lady uh, that came and visited. Well, she they moved up to Springdale from Miami. And so they come to the shul about once a month. And She came here the first time. She says, I want to meet Mary and I want to meet Tom. And they weren't here, either one. Okay, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. It's, uh, it's, it's such a great privilege to, uh, to share your word with one another. And uh, Father, it's, it's a, a blessing greater than what we deserve. We pray you continue to write your Torah on our hearts and minds and, and bless our fellowship this evening. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen.